Good morning, everyone. I'm Timothy Owens, State Librarian, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Uh, before we get started about the program, I would like to talk about the State Library just briefly. So founded in 1812, we are the principal library of state government. We build the capacity of all libraries, and we develop and support access to specialized collections for the people of North Carolina. September is Library Card Sign-Up Month, and a couple of years ago, our legislation was changed to allow the residents of North Carolina to get library cards. So if any of you do not have library cards with the State Library, I'd encourage you to step into the library after this program this morning and sign up for a library card to get access to all the resources about North Carolina that we provide. And today's program is an example of something new. This is the kickoff of our Everything NC Author Series uh, that the Government and Heritage Library staff have put together so that we can have conversations with North Carolina authors about subjects of interest to North Carolinians. Uh, there are a couple of uh, programs coming up in this series that I'll mention. On Saturday, October 26th, Sheila Amir will be talking about the Bulls of Durham. And on Saturday, November 16th, Dr. Lee Williams will be speaking about We Who Believe in Freedom, The Life and Times of Ella Baker. So I hope you'll plan to come back for both of those events. Also, after today's program, there will be a book signing with our speaker. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Christensen. Rob retired from the News and Observer in December 2018 after writing about North Carolina politics as a reporter and a columnist for 45 years. He has appeared on more than 600 TV or radio programs as a political analyst, including the CBS Evening News, CNN's Inside Politics, MSNBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews, ABC's Nightline, Fox News, and various PBS programs. I think he has all the networks covered there. He has contributed chapters to five books on North Carolina and the South. His first solo book, The Paradox of Tar Heel Politics by UNC Press, was judged the best work of nonfiction by a North Carolinian in 2008 by the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association. His most recent book, The Rise and Fall of the Branchhead Boys, was published by UNC Press in May of this year. He is currently working on a history of the Daniels family and the News and Observer. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Christensen. Thank you so much for coming out today, and, and I first, my first order of business is be to thank the, uh, the library for hosting this event. And uh, I feel like I'm in a second home here because uh, I, so much of my work in this book was done at State Archives, and some of the people in, in this audience did a tremendous amount of work to helping me, and I'm looking at you, Kim. And, uh, and so I'm greatly appreciative. I mentioned in my book a uh, number of them who, who were helpful, and I'm sure I don't get everybody, but uh, I should give at least a shout out to, uh, to uh, uh, Doug Brown, uh, Van Evans, Josh Hager, Allison Thurman, Matthew Crane, Colleen Griffiths, and Gabe Bradley. I, I read that just because I don't want to leave people out. So, uh, so a lot of states have a family that's really important important political family. And you can think of like the Birds of Virginia or the Talmadges of Georgia or the Longs of Louisiana or the Bushes of Texas or the Browns of California. And the Scott family is that family in North Carolina. Now, not only are they an important family, but they're also a very colorful family. So let me start out with a story. So Carr Scott's first year in office was 1949. And he was invited uh, to speak at halftime at the State Carolina game, which is being played at Keenan Stadium. The reason he was going to ask to talk because he was, uh, it was Greater University Day, and they wanted the governor to 
to get on a microphone system and talk to the crowd. Now, if you know anything about the Scots, you know that they were they bled red. They were uh, there's book, there are Scott buildings over at the NC State campus and so forth. So they were huge NC State people. And so it was a big deal for Carr Scott as a new governor to go speak at Keenan Stadium at halftime. So Scott goes, uh, goes down on the field at, and, at halftime and says, you know, I'm a, big, uh, I'm a big NC State fan and my family's all a big NC State fan. He says, but I want you to know that we're, we have some major projects coming up here in, in, in uh, Chapel Hill. He said, in fact, he says, we're building a great new hospital here. He says, he says, he says, quote, we are rushing to build the building of a great hospital here. And the crowd was silent. And he added, <clears throat> because we are going to need it to take care of the Carolina players after State College gets through with them. And there was just a cascade of boos from the Carolina crowd. And so uh, that was, he, even, he couldn't even, Car Scott couldn't even go to a football game without uh, without stirring things up, so he was, he's that kind of a character. Uh, but he was more, no more more than just for his quips. He was a uh, Alamance dairy farmer and lived all his life on the farm, even when he was governor. Uh, he would commute every weekend back to to Hall River in Alamance County. He uh, he was uh, he was a tobacco chewer and a cigar smoker and. And, and didn't mind cussing a little bit. He, had, he was certainly rough around the edges. Uh, and, but he was a very important figure. So he was elected uh, agriculture commissioner in 1936 and governor in 1948 and, and, uh, and then senator in 1954. He died in office. But his whole family and, and his supporters were called uh, Branchhead Boys, which is why the name of the book, The Rise and Fall of Branchhead Boys. Now, Carr Scott was an insurgent he was the right at the time that the the Democratic Party was the over was one party state really, and, and the Democratic Party was controlled by by a, a political organization machine, and he was running against the scene, scene the machine. He was an insurgent, and so he did not get the support of any of the anybody in the legislature or any of the judges or any of the courthouse crowds. So what he would go when he would go into a county, and everybody would. Cants would campaign in counties back then, all across the state. <clears throat> First thing he would do is he would go back in, into the most rural parts of the state <clears throat> and visit with, with the country people. And he, he said they were the head of the creeks or the head of the branches, the most rural people. And by the time he got to the courthouse, where the sheriff was probably for his opponent and the, and the judges and the clerk of court were for his opponent, he didn't need their votes because he had all the support of the country people or what he called the Branchhead Boys, which is where you get the name uh, Branchhead Boys. Now, <clears throat> the cover of my book, and uh, Kim helped find this for me, it's a great picture, is a picture of Carr Scott in 1954, and he's uh, at Hargett's Crossroad down east, and he's got a bull calf. And this was one of the great political stunts of North Carolina history. And so let me tell you a little bit about that. So <clears throat> when Carr Scott was a young man, besides being a dairy farmer, he also traded cattle and auctioned cattle at various places across the state. And so when he was in Kinston, he, uh, he, had, a, he had a cattle auction, but it's probably back in the 1920s. <clears throat> and then he had something at Hargett's uh, Crossroads at the ne uh, that, that, uh, next. But he didn't have an automobile. So he went and tried to find out how much it would cost to take a ca taxi cab from uh, Kinston to Hargett's Crossroad. It was 21 miles. <clears throat> and the taxi cab driver said, well, that's going to cost you $21. Well, $21 was a small fortune in the 1920s. So he walked the 21 miles. And it took him about six hours. And he retold that story when he was running for the United States Senate in 1954 when he went to a Kinston radio station. He said, I remember when I walked from Kinston to Hargett's Crossroads 21 miles in order to save a $21 taxi cab fare. So <clears throat> he says, in fact, he said, what I'm going to do, he says, if anybody can do that and beat my time today, which was 1954, he says, I will give him a free uh, uh, bull calf. And so that big, so began the great bull calf walk. And there were thousands of people who showed up for that, lined the road, uh, trying people walking those 21 miles from Kinston to Hargett's Crossroads. 
got headlines in all the newspapers. It was a great publicity, publicity stunt. Tremendous amount of coverage. 40 people uh, uh, participated. 39 finished and won, and they all beat him, uh, beat, uh, beat his time, won, winning 39 bull calves. So Scott gave away 39 bull calves. The, the winner was a man from, was a mailman from Burlington, who obviously was a good walker. And, and so uh, he, he, won, he won the contest. Now, <clears throat> they, they had people donate the bull calves. Now, since I've been out talking about this book, I've had a number of people who grew up in dairy farms, and they've explained to me that a bull calf is almost worthless. So what, they weren't giving away something tremendously. And I remember Locke Faircloth telling me, he says, you know, I suspect that a lot of these people who won those bull calves had no idea of what to do with it, but there you go. So, but it was a great stunt, got him hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of publicity, and probably is the greatest political publicity stunt ever in North Carolina politics. So my last book on the, on, on the rise and fall of the Branchhead Boys is not just on Carr Scott, it's on the whole Scott family. And the whole family was involved in politics. So Carr Scott's daddy, Bob Scott, was a well-known farmer. He was such a well-known farmer that he was nicknamed Farmer Bob. People knew him as Farmer Bob. And he, he, was, uh, he helped establish NC State. He was a legislator. He was a member of the Agriculture Commissioner. And Carr Scott came along, and Carr Scott's uh, brother, Ralph Scott, was a very influential legislator. Carr Scott's son, Bob Scott, was elected lieutenant governor in 64 and governor in 68 and was the head of the community college system for a very, very long time. And then following uh, his, his daughter-in-law, uh, Jesse Ray Scott, ran for unsuccessfully for state labor commissioner. And his granddaughter, Meg Scott Phipps, ran for, uh, for agriculture commissioner and was elected in 2000. But that's another story. So, but it wasn't just the family members that made the Scotts so influential. It was more than just the uh, family. He, he influenced a, a whole generation of North Carolina politicians. So <clears throat> among them, Terry Sanford was a statewide campaign manager. That's how he really built up his political base, is managing Carr Scott's 54 Senate race. And of course, Terry Sanford would go on and become governor and <clears throat> senator and president of Duke University. Jim Hunt. Jim Hunt was uh, idolized Carr Scott as a boy. And I can remember even a number of years ago being on, on Jim Hunt's farm in Wilson County. And he says, he pointed to me at his prize bull. And he says, Rob, he says, he says, do you know the name of that prize bull? I said, no, sir, I do not. He says, it's Carr Scott. So he named his prize bull Carr Scott. But he was, uh, his parents uh, were, uh, were, uh, were big Carr Scott supporters, and he became a Carr Scott supporter. But even conservatives like Jesse Helms, Jesse Helms, wrote to Carr Scott and when he was a young radio reporter here, here in Raleigh. He was covering the Carr Scott and suggesting that he, he is the first North Carolinian of his generation that could be elected president. So he encouraged him to think about running for president, Jesse Helms. And Carr Scott's driver was Locke Faircloth, who later became a state official and later U.S. Senator as a Republican. So he, he had a tremendous influence on a whole generation of politis, politicians. Now, how is it that the Scots, and particularly Carr Scott, became so influential? What is it about them? And to really understand that, you have to go back in time to a, 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 go back a couple generations in North Carolina before, before sushi and before Starbucks and before selfies. And so North Carolina was a far, far different state back then. So in the mid-20th century, two-thirds of North Carolina was considered rural. So it was either small town or rural. The largest city in, uh, in mid-century in North Carolina was Charlotte, which had 134,000 people, which is today smaller than Cary, which is just a suburb of Raleigh. Raleigh had only uh, 65,000 people back then. So most people lived in the country. Now, and, and the other thing was that this state was almost entirely native North, North Carolinians. This is before the Sun Belt uh, growth and people coming in from all over the country. So almost everybody who lived in North Carolina was from generations of North Carolinians. So it was a far, far different state. Now, <clears throat> if you lived in Raleigh or a lot of the other cities or major towns, life was pretty good. Things were, the state was, was industrializing, they were modernizing, you had all the modern amenities. But that was not true if you lived in the countryside. Because in the countryside, 
<clears throat> a lot of modern amenities simply didn't exist. So today we talk about the great gap between urban and rural North Carolina, but the gap, the gap was even more dramatic uh, back in the 1930s and 40s and the 50s because uh, uh, people were living without electricity and without telephones and on dirt roads. And this is what, and to understand the Scott legacy and what Scott, why the Scots were so influential, you have to understand a little bit about what North Carolina was like back then. So I'm not going to give you a lot of statistics, but let me give you a couple. So in 1935, 11% <clears throat> of American farms had electricity. 11% of American farms had electricity. In North Carolina, only 3% did. 3% compared to the national average, 11%. So in, well, if you lived on, the North, on a farm in North Carolina in 1935, you probably did not have electricity. And <clears throat> life without electricity is really hard to imagine today. So um, all the work of lifting bales and everything and milking cows was all done by hand. <clears throat> the, you had to chop wood to feed wood stoves, which were very hard or messy and hard to regulate. You, know, you had to use kerosene lamps. Um, you know, it's, uh, 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 you know, without refrigerators, vegetables had to be canned right away uh, and, and to store it up to, so that it could be preserved. Think about what washing day was like in the pre-electric pre North Carolina. So the, the way it would work is that women would have, would have to heat up the water on the, probably on the stove and, and then they'd uh, wash their clothes in these big cast iron tubs using lye soap off until their hands were rubbed raw. And then you had to rinse it, and you had, so you had to get more water from the well to rinse, rinse, your, uh, to rinse the laundry. Then you had to hang it up. And then to iron it, think about this, there were no electric irons, so you had to put the iron uh, on, on your wood stove to heat up repeatedly if you are going to iron. And so and these, were, these were days when people had very large families. And so it was a heck of a lot of work just, just that one thing on washing day. And, and it wore out people, and it wore out women because it was washing was considered a woman's work. And it, a lot of women aged before their time because they were just ground down by the hard, hard, hard work. Now, <clears throat> the power company said it was not economical to run electric lines, power lines out into the countryside unless they could recoup the cost within three years. <clears throat> and even if they, when they agreed to run those power lines out to the countryside because the houses were so uh, uh, widely distributed. They often made, you, made the farmer and farm family sign a contract. So, so you would have to buy a washing machine uh, and a refrigerator because they didn't want you to, to run the line out there and only have pay for your, your light bulb. They wanted to make sure they could make some money. <clears throat> Even if you had electricity, it was often uh, out in the country, it was often a terrible, uh, a terrible electricity. It was just, uh, it was really, really bad service. So one of the things I, that I, I've spent a lot of time in this building doing research in the archives, and one of the really interesting things is looking at the letters of, of constituents going, written to Carr Scott, asking him to do something about getting electric power out into the countryside. So his, this here was a letter that came from a pastor in, in Panago County named man named Herman Minima. And this is what he wrote to Governor Scott. He said, he, now, he said, they have electricity there, but this is the conditional electricity. He says, without warning, our electric may be turned off for as long as 48 hours. At present, we can expect to be without electric about two or three hours every day. When we do have electric, we never know whether it'll be so strong that the bulbs will burn out in a week, or so weak that the motors will not turn over. Can you imagine living with electricity of that nature? <clears throat> and when electricity was finally uh, brought to the countryside, it would transform rural life, providing hot water, refrigerators, washing machines, and light. One of Carr Scott's fam favorite letters from a constituent came from a farm wife who had, who had just gotten electricity for her farm. She wrote Governor Scott, been married 40 years, and for the first time, I can see what my husband looks like. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <clears throat> now, 
Today, we don't leave we don't leave the house with one of these things. These iPhones are like attached to us, like uh, like an arm or something. But in 1945, only 5% of North Carolina farms had telephone service, which was the lowest percent in the country except for South Carolina. Thank God for South Carolina. There were huge areas of the state uh, that were without electricity. Um, and they often had tragic results. So in 1949, for example, there were seven children killed in a school bus accident in Nash County near the little town of Middlesex. It was a bus crash, and, and the problem was there was not only not a phone at the school for them to call for the ambulances, but there wasn't a phone within five miles of that school. And so after, after that happened, the group of parents wrote to Governor Carr Scott and said, you know, some of these children's lives might have been saved if there had been some telephone service at the school or within the school, and they could have gotten ambulances out there more quickly. So, so how having telephones could, could really be a matter of life and death. And, you know, <clears throat> we think about rural areas, but you know, large parts of, like even the urban counties were rural. So, you know, uh, large parts of Mecklenburg County were rural. That's, remember, Billy Graham grew up on a dairy farm in Mecklenburg County. Large swaths of Wake County were rural. And without, and without telephone service. So think about, think about this, you know, that you had school bus drivers who were students who would take the bus home, and in the, in the morning they would, you know, pay, go run their route and take the kids to school. So what happens uh, <clears throat> at the school when the school bus doesn't show up? Is the student just sick and couldn't make it in and he couldn't telephone in because there was no way to contact him? Or was the bus in an automobile crash or did it slip off the road into a ditch? What, or is it stuck in the mud? We don't know. So if the bus didn't show up at time, somebody from the school would have to would have to trace the route backwards, see if they find that bus. And maybe they, maybe they found the bus was had, had, had uh, was stuck somewhere, or maybe they found the kid was just sick and couldn't run, run his route that day. But that was the only way they could find that out. Think about other things too. So that one of the persons writing was a professor at Appalachian State University named O. D. Stallings. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Stallings had grown up in Nash County, and he grew up on a farm, and, and his father still lived on his farm. His mother had died, but the father was getting old, but he still wanted to farm the old, the old home place. And so, but he was living alone. But there was not only not a phone on the farm, but there was not a phone within five miles of that farm. So if the son who's teaching in Boone wants to find a checkup on his dad to make sure he's okay, he's, you know, he's, he knows he's aging and so forth, he has to get on the road and ride all the way from Boone to Nash County and then turn around and go back again just to check up on his dad. And this is, the, by the way, in the age before there were interstates. So that was a much longer trip back then than it is today. So, um, and so even when phone service was available, it was often terrible, uh, just like the electric service was sometimes terrible. So. Voight Gilmore of the W.M. Story Lumber Company of Southern Pines would complain to Governor Scott that it would sometimes take hours to get a phone call through. Now, you know how uh, irritating it is if one of your phone calls is dropped, but can, can you imagine taking a couple hours to get a phone call through? And, and this, his, his complaint was not personal. It was, how, how do I run my business and get orders and stuff? And it takes, it takes me a couple hours to get a phone call through. But that's what it was like in mid-century. Oftentimes, in some towns, like the small town of Bahama in, in Durham County, there was only one phone in town, and that was at the local uh, general store. And so when the general store closed at 5 or 6 o'clock at night, that was the last phone service in and out of town. So if your child got sick and you needed a country doctor to come, they still had home visits then, if you needed a country doctor or you needed help or whatever, you see, if, if, you, if it happened after 6 o'clock, you were out of luck, or you had to go, go to the next town to make a telephone call to get help. So, uh, so even if you had phone service, it was often uh, sparse or unreliable. Now, even more than electricity and telephones, Scott is the best known, Car Scott is best known as the governor who got the farmer out of the mud. You may have heard that, the farmer out of the mud. Now, <clears throat> before the 1920s, um, but the way most people got around in North Carolina for any long distance was by train. 
there were 1,500 communities in North Carolina served by train service back then. So <clears throat> if you wanted to get from, not only from Raleigh to Chapel Hill, you'd take a train. Or if you wanted to get from Raleigh to Wilson, you'd take a train. Um, I, I remember reading even back in the 1940s, uh, Jesse Helms, who was a student of Wake Forest, when Wake Forest was still located in Wake County, and he, was, he had a, a part-time job. He was working his way through college at Wake Forest at the News Observer, and he was doing proofreading at News Observer. And he would take the train, passenger train, from Wake Forest to Raleigh and back again is how he got back and forth to work. So that's how people got around. Now, that for short, short area, for short trips, you know, they would walk or they would take a carriage or something. But for long trips, it was a train. Now, in the 1920s, it all began to change because people began getting cars and so forth. And, and that's when the state went on a big, huge road building pro, uh, project. They went heavily in debt, uh, and that was when the North Carolina uh, built the ma main major artery roads between Raleigh and Greensboro and Chapel Hill and so forth. And that was when North Carolina became known as the good road state. You probably have heard the term good road state. That was the 1920s. But what happened next, of course, was Depression, 1930s. And there was no money to build roads. And then the 1940s came, and there was money, but almost all the building material had to go to the war effort. And so there were no, very few roads being built in the 1930s, 1940s. And even the roads of 1920 were only the artery roads. And so the vast majority of country roads were still dusty roads that, were, were, that turned into rivers of mud whenever you had a heavy rain. And so, uh, uh, when, when, uh, and Carr Scott knew all about this because he, he was now, when he, he, he started out, he was a farmer, but he also had extra income. He worked as an Alamance County farm extension agent. And during the 10 years that he worked as a farm extension agent, he wore out 22 sets of car chains just driving around Alamance County because of the bad, terrible road conditions. And then he was elected agriculture commissioner in 1936, and he drove, he commuted every day from. I guess Highway 54, from Alamance County to his office here, just, uh, and then he, at the end of the day, he'd drive back. And, and so he often, the roads were often so bad that he'd have to have a tractor pull, pull his car two miles to get to the main road so he could, every, every morning so he could get to Raleigh because the, the roads were so bad. So when he became governor, the state was responsible for 62,000 miles of roads but only 16,000 have, have been paid. So the mo large portions of the state were still on dirt roads. Now, <clears throat> he, among other things, he proposed a, a $200 million bond issue, which was a huge amount of money back then to build roads. Now, he, he knew the hardships uh, people had on, on the roads from uh, personal experience. But he, if he, even if he hadn't, people would write into him and tell him about how hard, how difficult it was. You know, some of it was just, just irritation. So if, so if you were a housewife, for example, uh, if you were living on a dirt road, things would often get so dusty you couldn't hang your laundry out. Or, uh, or the dust would become so heavy and you'd have to close the windows of your house in the day before there was any air conditioning. Uh, or, you know, you get stuck and you have to hire somebody to get it with a tractor to get you, pull you out of the mud. But those were irritations. Bad roads often were a matter of life and death. So uh, I'd like you to listen to a couple of voices here of your parents or your grandparents. So <clears throat> there was a guy named Reeves Nolan who was an agricultural agent from Haywood County up the mountains. And he wrote to Carr Scott about uh, what happened to him. He said, a number of years ago, when we only had one boy, which was our first son, he had an attack of illness, and the country doctor advised us to rush him to a hospital in Asheville. We started out in a car in the morning, but the roads were so bad, we could not get through across the mountains. So a team of horses pulled us back, and we started up a very rough road in another direction and arrived in Asheville late that night but it was too late. He lost his son. Sometimes people became stranded on these dirt roads and just died on these roads. So one of the people writing to Carr Scott was a principal from the Outer Banks named Charles Thorne. And he wrote about what happened to a man uh, who uh, became stuck on the main road to Manioc, a man named Miller Douglas. Uh, 
wrote, wrote the principal, he was unable to secure aid during the night, although he suffered a hemorrhage from the strain of trying to push his car out of the sand. Within a few days, he died. Of course, this is somewhat unusual occurrence, and yet it should not be allowed to happen in our state. It is not rare for people to have to spend the night in an automobile on these banks. To be precise, there was a Coast Guardsman who froze to death last year because he was stuck trying to get home on his, on his road. Now, I presume the Coast Guardsman was a young man in fairly decent shape, and he still died on one of those roads. I remember reading other letters. One was from a farm family in Marshville. Marshville was country back then. It's not part of, you know, it's part of the triangle. But being stuck in Marshville and just worried to death because for, for, for weeks at a time, they couldn't really get out uh, in the snow and so forth in the mud. Get, get out from their farm. You know, and her mother was, had a heart condition and it was living with him. And she so was worried about what would happen if her mother had a, had a heart attack and, you know, or, or her children became ill. There was no way to get a country doctor in or to get them into, into town to, to, to be treated. So this was a matter of life and death. So Carr Scott, uh, 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 one thing to remember, he battled, he had a real battle to fight to get get more roads and to get the telephone and power companies to extend lines. Now, the legislature at that time was all Democratic, or most, mostly Democratic, and Carr Scott was a Democrat. This was a one-party state. If you were a liberal, you were a Democrat. You were a moderate, you were a Democrat. You were a conservative, you were a Democrat. And all the fights happened within the Democratic primary. And as you, as you may recall, Carr Scott was the insurgent, and so most all the legislators had supported his opponent in the Democratic primary and did not want to see him succeed and, and so did everything to try to block him. So Carr Scott would go over the people's heads. He would go on statewide radio hookups and he, he would complain about the can't-do club of the legislature or the obstructionist clique that was holding back his programs in the legislature. He would have huge rallies at Memorial Auditorium and farmers from across the state would come in in, in their bib overalls and, uh, and they would uh, show up and, to try to intimidate the legislature to show to get them, get them moving on these on these programs. He would he would single out lobbyists by names by saying these lobbyists and and, and you know would run pictures of them or, or blocking your programs. And he went after people like uh, the head of the Power Carolina Power and Light Company. Now the head of the Power Carolina Power and Light Company at the time was a guy named L. V. Sutton. His initials are important. L. V. Sutton. Scott started calling, referring to him as low voltage Sutton. So he would go after the head of CPNL to try to, to pressure him to get, to bring in, uh, 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 to, to do a better job of getting uh, the power, power lines, electricity to the countryside. Now, <clears throat> it's what's interesting about this is the Scots, even though this is an important family, they were not operating in a vacuum. But they were in fact a couple of political movements uh, that came out of rural North Carolina uh, that were really were the progressive engines during a couple periods of North Carolina history. Now today, we associate uh, the rural areas as being the most conservative areas of the state. And, we've, and, we, and we associate progressivism with places like Raleigh, the Triangle, and the Charlotte, and so forth. But, but that was not always the case. So there were at least two pitchfork rebellions in this state where the farmers really upset the apple, political apple cart because they wanted a more activist government. So the first was the 1890s and where you had the Farmers Alliance and they came in, they elected an entirely new legislature, a new governor, new statewide offices and so forth. And it was during that period, for example, that NC State got built because uh, they wanted, a, they thought UNC Chapel Hill was too elitist and they wanted some industrial and agricultural training for the average person. That was when <coughs> uh, uh, Women's College, now UNC Greensboro was built. It was when North Carolina A&T University, uh, the, one of the largest black institutions, historically black institutions, was built. And so those were some of the fruits for the, for the, uh, for the uh, 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 rural progressivism in the 1890s. Now in 1929, uh, they, the, the things were still bad in the countryside. And so there was another movement that was formed. It was the North Carolina Grange, and they were invited to come into the state and organize. They had a meeting over at the Capitol, uh, uh, and, uh, and the Grange began. 
And the Grange was a, a, an organization that was not partisan, but it had a particular agenda. And it wanted to improve the lives of, of rural people. And so uh, the Grange was very important. Carr Scott was ahead of the Grange, and that was his political base. Enabled him to move to all across the state as head of the Grange to, uh, to make to get support and find out what people are wanting. His son, Bob Scott, was ahead of the Grange, just like his father was, and that was his political base. And he, and he would say that was his most important political weapon was his membership in the Grange, except for the uh, family name being important as well. Jim Hunt was a Grange baby. His parents were both huge uh, presidents of their chapters of the Grange and helped organize Granges throughout East North Carolina. In fact, Jim Hunt was a Grange baby. So uh, his mother and father would take him to Grange meetings in the bassinet and sit him there on the table. So he was hearing these Grange talks while he was a baby. So he was a true, and he met his wife, Carolyn, who was an Iowa farm, farm girl at a Grange meeting. So he came up to the Grange. So people forget about how important the Grange was, but, and, and, but it, was, it was in fact uh, uh, one of the engines for, for progressivism for trying to get more programs out to the countryside for better schools and for better better and more roads and for power companies and so forth. <clears throat> now, one of the really interesting things in looking at the letters, I spent hours and hours and hours going in the state archives and and which which all thankfully are in one place uh, in, here here in Raleigh, one central location. And one of the really things that really is really, really striking when you look at those letters is to look at the tenor of the letters that came into Carr Scott when he was after he was elected governor in 1948, and the tenor of the letters that came into Bob Scott when he was elected governor in 1968, exactly 20 years later. So the letters coming into Carr Scott were from rural people saying they wanted a more activist government. They wanted they wanted a government that's going to to push the power companies. It's going to build roads to build better schools. It was a very progressive message. 20 years later, the message would have turned around entirely. And so the message then was get the government off our backs. Totally different tenor. It changed dr dramatically in 20 years. Now, there are a lot of things that were happening. One of the major things was the integration of the, race, of the schools. They were schools, even though we had the uh, Brown versus Board of Education 54, it wasn't really until 68 that the schools became integrated in a major way. And that was a, a traumatic experience in many, many communities. Um, one of the uh, things that I found uh, just really shocking is that when, caught, when Bob Scott, who was elected in 68, took, became, uh, became governor in 69, his first six months in office, he activated the National Guard for civil disturbances nine times. Nine times he called out the National Guard for civil disturbances. I can't remember the last time a, a North Carolina governor called out the National Guard for civil disturbances, but that was such a uh, tumultuous time. Um, so, uh, and, and so we had, uh, we had anti-war efforts, we had civil rights demonstrations, and my book deals with uh, you know, takeovers and, 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 and clashes at UNC Chapel Hill and at Duke and at North Carolina A&T and, and uh, the aftermath of Kent State uh, about racial unrest in places like Raleigh, Wilmington, Henderson, Warrington, Oxford, Durham, Winston-Salem, and Roxborough. So we didn't have we didn't have these huge riots that uh, that we read about in Detroit or Watts or Newark, New Jersey, but we had lots and lots of small racial uh, 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 disturbances, and that had a powerful effect too, made voters a lot more conservative. So here are several reasons of why things changed so much between Carr Scott, the governor, and his son, Bob Scott, and why rural people went from being uh, uh, the progressive force in the state to more conservative force in the state. One of them was uh, the nature of farming uh, uh, had changed. So uh, at the high point, there were more than 300,000 farms in North Carolina when Carr Scott was coming along. Today, there are fewer than 50,000 farms. So the farmer has, by and large, disappeared. But it's not just the number of farmers, it's the, it's the size and the, and, 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 uh, of the, those farms. So a lot of those farmers were tenant farmers, white and black. 
or they were uh, or they were small farmers trying to eke out, who owned their own land trying to eke out a living, and they were often very very poor. Today, a lot of the farming operations are 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 they're small businesses and they're they're computerized and they're very sophisticated, and so they have a different idea about uh, whether they think gov they need government to help help them. Uh, another one, another change was uh, North Carolina was a very poor state mid 20th century. The end of this, by the end of the century, it was, it was and, and it was becoming moving more up, becoming more middle class, getting closer to the national average, and fewer of your people saw a need for government help. They didn't they didn't see themselves as underdogs anymore, and so that changed things. And then the use of religion was, was interesting, is that the Scots were all big Presbyterians. They were very active in their church. And Carr Scott would use religion over and over again in his speeches. He would, he would quote the Bible frequently. Uh, he would say, we've got to build these roads in, in part so people could get to church on Sunday. And so, by this, so, so the Scots would use uh, religion as a force for, uh, for moral uplift, just so we want, like you want to improve your your morality and your spirituality, you also want to improve your living conditions, and they tie the two in together. But by the time the Bob Scott was coming along, we began getting some of these social issues, things like abortion and, and gay rights and so forth, and, and conservatives uh, were, were, were winning the support of a lot of people who were spiritually inclined. Um, so, uh, so there was a dramatic, dramatic change from the 20 years. Uh, now, the Scots uh, were far from perfect. Uh, and if you follow the Carr Scott, uh, I mean, they did things that would get the federal prosecutors on today. So he had so many roads built in or around his farm that, the state, that, the, that there was a gravel pit built by a contractor on his farm, which he leased out, because there were so many roads being built around his farm. Uh, and so there, was the, the whole, there were no campaign finance laws. And so things were really, really loose, loose back then. Um, and that would eventually, uh, and then there were lots of political bosses. Things were often, the votes were controlled by county machines or by local sheriffs or local clerks of court and so forth. So it was much, much different. Um, Meg Scott Phipps, who came along in 2000, didn't get the memo that, that things had changed and that, uh, uh, that, you, that camp there were campaign finance laws. You just couldn't take money. It used to be that if you ran for agriculture commissioner, you, if all you had to do is, is because this was a democratic state, is get the approval of the of the democratic bigwigs, and if you were if you were in good standing with them, you would get elected. But when we became a two-party state, uh, and the machines went away and broke down or went away, then you had to, have to had to start raising huge amounts of money, and May Scott Phipps raised had to raise more than a million dollars to get elected labor commissioner. Uh, and, or uh, agriculture commissioner, excuse me. And so where do you turn? Well, well, one of the places you turn is people who do business with the state or people who are regulated by the state. And, and one of the major things that the agriculture commissioner does is run the state fair. And um, one of the major things out there uh, that's contested is who's going to get the contract for all the rides and for all the amusements. And so she had to deal with all these carny people who are probably not most upstanding people and who deal with lots of cash. And she ended up taking a lot of cash, and uh, not for self-enrichment, but just to help pay for her campaign. And that resulted in her end up going to, to prison. But to tell you how uh, loose politics were uh, back then, there's a story uh, of Carr Scott when he was, he had been elected governor, and then he was running in, in 48, 1954, he was running for the United States Senate. So he was going back to all the Democratic leaders who had supported him in the past to try to say, well, you supported me when I was governor. Would you support me if I run when, now that I'm running for Senate? And one of these, one of these local uh, politicos was a local moonshiner up in the mountains. And he goes, he, he goes to the, the, guy, the guy's place in the morning, and uh, he, the guy's sleeping off a big drunk. And so he asks the moonshiner, he says, will you, will you support me? You support me last time, you support me this time. And so the moonshiner says, he says, he says, the precinct, he says, will be for you 100%. And Carr Scott says, great. And so he's leaving. And then the moonshiner comes trailing after Carr Scott and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, he says, he says let's make that 98% for you. 100% wouldn't look regular. 
So you could see how politics was, uh, was so controlled then. Uh, the, one, the Scots didn't think that anybody in Al from Alamance County ever belonged in prison. So Ralph Scott, who was a brother of one governor and uncle of another, was infamous for trying to get people paroled who, who were sent to jail from Alamance County. And so he went into, when Terry Sanford was governor one time, Ralph Scott, who was an important legislator, goes in and sees the governor and he says, well, we got these couple of these boys or Alamance County. He says, he says, all they did was steal some hubcaps. He says, and they ought not to be in prison. They ought to be back home supporting their families and out back in Alamance County. And the go so the governor says, well, I'll, I'll look at it. And so he has one of his aides look up to see what's going on. And in fact, it was true that those boys had stolen the hubcaps. He says, what, what Ralph Scott had not told him is they also stole the rest of the car. <laughs> so Bob Scott was nearly as colorful uh, as, his, as, his, uh, as his father. He would hold black tie possum dinners at the executive mansion where everybody was in their tuxedos. It was all men. And, uh, and they had uh, the possum delivered under a big silver tray, which they'd unveil. And, uh, and they, have, uh, uh, they, had, they would have, of course, the inmates serving there in their white gloves. So they, had, they, would, have, they would have the possum dinners. They also, uh, uh, there was at the time a, a News Observer columnist named Charlie Craven. Charlie Craven's column would appear in the back of the paper. And, and Charlie Craven was, didn't really write about politics. He just wrote about life in downtown Raleigh. And in particular, he hung out at this one pool hall where there was a bunch of guys who were, had no obvious means of supporting themselves or were spending their time hanging out uh, kind of at kind of a lowly group. But he would write, Charlie would write about them and he would have, write about the pearls of wisdom from the local uh, pool hall about, uh, about whatever. And so one time, Bob Scott, when he was governor, called up Charlie. He says, Charlie, he says, how about if I take the limousine? He says, if we stop by the pool hall, he says, we'll pick up, pick up you and all your buddies, and we'll take them to the executive mansion, and we'll spend the afternoon shooting pool and drinking beer. Charlie says, that'd be a great idea, Governor. So Car Scott has, or Bob Scott, excuse me, just goes, as, just, as, just as he said, goes, stops by the pool hall. Uh, he plays, playing the role, because he He's got a cigar. There's a picture of him. He's got a cigar in his mouth. He's got a pair of sunglasses on. And he picks up the pool hall, uh, pool hall guys, and they go up to the mansion and they spend the afternoon drinking beer and playing pool. And they also, after a while, decide to play poker. And one of the pool hall guys, which was a guy named Rexy Rexy, uh, was dealing and playing in poker. And he deals the governor a straight flush. And the governor turns to Rexy Rexy and he says, he says, that kind of thing could get you a judgeship. So, so he was quite a character. Now, for all their faults, the Scots did much good for North Carolina. Now, let me, uh, let me give you another letter that went into Carr Scott. This was written by a guy named Sam Peel, who was a Sam Peel, excuse me, Sam Peel, who was a rural letter carrier from Hamlet, North Carolina. And he wrote to Scott in 1951. And this is what he wrote. When I voted for you for governor, I thought you would make a good governor, but I never dreamed you would put over a program like you have. I am a rural mail carrier and have been traveling over 54 miles of rough, dusty roads every day, serving about 2,000 people and burning lots of gasoline. But now, I'm glad to say, I have 36 miles of good blacktop roads and they really drive good. I want to say that you, in my estimation, you are the greatest governor North Carolina has ever had. To the people who needed lights, telephones, good roads, and anything else for the betterment of North Carolina, you have been a miracle of divine grace. You are in a class to yourself. To try to describe you is, try, is to try to describe forked lightning, which can be seen running in every direction and always producing results. Now, I ask you, when was the last time you heard a politician described as a miracle of divine grace? I bet you it's been a while. So, <clears throat> so during my book tour, one of the interesting things is that uh, I've had a number of people come up to me, and they bring to me uh, certificates that, uh, that their father or their grandfather got from Carr Scott. What Carr Scott would do is that he'd send to his supporters a certificate 
uh, naming you uh, uh, a, uh, a country squire, which was sort of the, the North Carolina version of a Kentucky colonel. And people would take these and they'd, they'd get them framed and put on their walls and they would hand, they would hand them down to their children and to their grandchildren. So people would come up to me during some of my talks and they would show me their father, their grandfather, whoever it was, it was a country squire. And this is what the certificate said. This is naming you a country squire. If you got one of, one, you got one of these, this is what it was said. It says, I, Governor W. Carr Scott, note that he is one of the branchhead boys born and bred in the Tar Heel State who has quit dragging his feet and is catching up on his Holland. And whereas he has demonstrated that he is a tried and true member of the rougher element and plows to the end of the row, and whereas he is versed in both the meaning and mystery of our significant and proclaimed dates, and whereas he is forward going and has a natural hankering for chitlins, possum, taters, lamb fries, pot liquor, corn pone, barbecue, and sassafras tea, I do therefore proclaim a, a, you a country squire entitled to all the rights and privileges of this estate. Now, you do not know this, but there's a, it was, there is a pop quiz at the end of this. Uh, I'm going to throw you a pop quiz right now at the end of my talk. I want to find out anybody in this audience would qualify as a country squire. So first of all, how many, I want to see a show of hands, how many have had chitlins? Okay, we have, we have a couple, we have a couple. Chitlins, for those who are not informed, are hog intestines. How many have had lamb fries? Lamb fries, you'll be sorry to know, are lamb testicles. How many have had corn pone? That's, that's the country cousin of cornbread. How many have had sassafras tea? Well, that's a number of people sassafras tea, made sassafras tree. And I bet you a lot of people have had pot liquor. How many pot, pot liquor? Yeah, yeah. Which is liquid left behind by the, after the boiling greens. So uh, it looks like we'd have a number of people in this audience that probably could qualify as country squires. So congratulations. So, so thank you so much for, for, for coming, and, and uh, I'll be glad to um, try to answer any questions you might have. So um, there were a couple things that, that uh, one was that, that the thing that most struck me was how, how progressive uh, rural North Carolina was during certain periods. They were the progressive engine uh, politically in this state. I think that was a surprise. And it was a surprise how fast it turned around, and it turned, turned around by the time the sun came along. Um, I, I guess um, I was surprised at how uh, how difficult life was on the farm. A lot of people have rose-colored glasses because they, they grew up on the farm. You know, they have very fond memories of good food and their families, and they were young, and it was their prime of their life and so forth. And so they often, um, you know, think very, have very warm feelings about growing up in the country, as you would expect, and, they, and, 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 with, and that's certainly reasonable. But it also doesn't take away just how incredibly difficult, and hard life and isolating life was in the country, countryside, and uh, and so I think that that surprised me a little bit too. Uh, and then also I was a little surprised. I came across all these various things where people were, the politicians were doing things that would get them indicted today, and they were just very open about it back then because there were no laws and so forth. And they're getting all these freebies. So Carr Scott, for example, was getting free fertilizer starting when he was agriculture commissioner, running until he was governor, uh, by the railroad car from some firm in Knoxville, who was, uh, and and thought nothing about it. 
and uh, and uh, he, in fact, he would send letters to him and said, "Well, you sent me fertilizer last year, and uh, and uh, he said we sure could use it again this year." And and then they they put they sent a rail car and put them on a railing near his near his farm and so forth. Thought nothing of it, and it was so it was and and it, and it was all there uh, in the in the records. No one tried to you know to cover it up or whatever. Uh, but today, you know, the federal prosecutors would be all over him if he did that. Yes, sir. Hey, I was upstairs in the archives. You mentioned something totally different when it was announced that we're going to get this crop. And uh, one of the people I'm interested in is a man named Jacob Slater. Um, was he car shop campaign manager for the first time, uh, um, the then uh, Nancy governor? Or did he have a relationship with? So Capus Wainick was, I, I think, a high point publisher, I think that's right, uh, uh, who had been involved in politics for a couple decades before Carr Scott really came up. And he was a very, very well-respected individual. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, when Carr Scott was, running for, was going to run for governor in 1948, he went to Capus Wainick and asked him to run his campaign. Capus Wainick said, would later recall that he would check around and ask everybody who knew everything about politics and said, well, does Carr Scott have a chance against the political machine? And everyone said, there's no way he has a chance. He'd be wasting your time. You don't want to get involved in that campaign. But he did, and he won. And uh, the uh, Capus Wainick uh, was, uh, uh, was one of the people who everyone thought was going to be named to a Senate vacancy in 1950 when instead uh, – Car Scott named Frank Porter Graham to the United States Senate. And then uh, Car Scott wanted Capus Wainick to succeed him as governor. But by that time, Capus Wainick was ambassador to, I think it was Nicaragua. And uh, he was in the middle of, uh, of that, before, uh, doing that public service and didn't feel like he wanted to, uh, he had more to do there and didn't want to come back to run for governor. So Capus Wainick was a, a pretty influential uh, figure and he was. Um, he was he was more aligned with the Scots and the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Well, thank you so much for coming out.